Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar in our webinar series for AIDS Education Month. Um, today, I'm here with Winter Bell, the Director of HIV and Prevention Education here at Philadelphia Fight, and they're going to be giving a webinar today entitled uh, Teaching from the Front Lines. Um, Teaching the Basics of HIV 101. Um, this is uh, kind of our introductory um, webinar um, for what will be a digitized series of uh, presentations that previously have been given in person to uh, participants of um, Project Teach, um, uh, Frontline Teach to be more specific. Um, so just a little uh, housekeeping, everyone is on mute currently. And if you have questions, please place them in the little Q&A box at the bottom. Um, and at the end, we will field any and all questions. Um, also, if you registered for this webinar, you should have received a pretest um, maybe a few moments ago. So please take that pretest. And then uh, after this webinar, we will administer a post test as well. So if you could do both of those in order, um, that would be incredibly helpful to us. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Winner. Winner. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I want to thank Cheetah for having us today. I also want to thank uh, the National Library of Medicine, who is our funder for this project. Um, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to get turn off the video so you can focus on the slides. I know all of you probably want to see my face, but Sorry. Um, so uh, today we are going to talk about HIV uh, basics. And uh, I'm from Project TEACH. So TEACH stands for Treatment Education Activists Combating HIV. Uh, we've been doing uh, education programs for folks living with HIV and also ser service folk, uh, frontline service folks and uh, family for 20 over 20 years now um, and so I'm happy to be here today as part of our AIDS Education Month to give you all some more information about HIV. So we're going to talk about uh, some basics and then I'm going to go through some resources um, at the end of this presentation for those of you who would like to learn more to go more in depth uh, and so uh, at the end of this session, you should understand what HIV is and what it does to the immune system and then also what AIDS is and what happens when someone has an AIDS diagnosis. So HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. Uh, that is an acronym. And so uh, we, uh, so the virus is something that um, gets into the body, gets into the bloodstream through an opening. And what it does is it weakens the immune system over time by hijacking the immune cells and turning them into cells that produce more um, HIV virions or more copies of HIV. Um, now, that's not a great thing because our immune system cells, our CD4 cells, are really important to keeping um, our bodies healthy and to helping us stave off illnesses. Um, and so when the HIV cells infect the CD4 cells, they can no longer protect the body. Um, and over time, uh, if this happens you know, without any treatment, folks can have an AIDS diagnosis. Um, and so AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Uh, and it is a diagnosis that someone gets after HIV has, immune, has weakened their immune system so much um, that there is almost no uh, immune system left. Um, so uh, just to be clear, someone can have HIV, but not AIDS but a person cannot have AIDS without having HIV. Um, so to receive an AIDS diagnosis, someone living with HIV needs to either have an immune system cell count or a CD4 cell count below 200 um, or what is called an opportunistic infection. And opportunistic infections are a list of specific diseases. So it's not any infection, it's a, it's a, a disease from a specific list 
that is identified by the CDC. Um, and these are illnesses that typically someone with a healthy immune system would be able to fight off on their own or with medication. However, with a weakened immune system, um, they become very dangerous to folks. And so folks can get very ill. Um, so the stages of an HIV infection, um, I have here broken into three stages. Now, um, I wanna just preface this with this isn't a roadmap uh, for an AIDS diagnosis, it's actually a continuum and then people can be at any place on this continuum. Everyone's body uh, reacts differently to HIV. Um, some folks can go 10 years without having uh, any type of symptoms uh, because of their immune system being weak. Um, for other folks, it could be three months. Um, so this is just a kind of a general layout. Um, and so the first stage is um, the acute or primary infection stage. Um, and that sometimes folks get um, what we call flu-like symptoms during the stage. Not everyone though, some folks have no symptoms. Um, and that, that can happen about two to four weeks after HIV has entered the body. Um, and then after those symptoms go away, the, uh, the kind of under, under the surface um, action starts happening. And this is when HIV is making copies of itself uh, by hijacking the immune system cells in the body. And so each um, HIV can create about 10 copies of itself per day. Um, so if you think about uh, 100 HIV variants uh, after one day, um, you know, that, that, that gives you 1,000, and then 1,000 make 10 in a day. You can see how over time that can grow exponentially. And then that what's, that's what leads to an AIDS diagnosis, because when the CD4 cells uh, are hijacked, not only are they no longer protecting the body, but they actually eventually disintegrate or, or die um, because they're, no, they're not really made to make copies of HIV. And so they, you know, they, they basically get worn to nothing. Um, and uh, HIV, the HIV virions that are new will go and just find a new cell uh, to make copies with. So. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about how, we talked a lot about the medical side, but I want to talk a little bit more about how HIV and AIDS are more than just um, a, a medical condition. Um, there are lots of intersecting factors um, that make HIV, uh, you know, many different things in different arenas. It's, it is economic, it is political. Um, and a social, emotional, and right now having an AIDS diagnosis is for life. Um, and so, you know, the medical purpose of, of, of an AIDS diagnosis is used to help uh, predict if folks are likely to get sick. Because again, going back to, you know, having 200 or less um, CD4 cells protecting the body isn't enough uh, for folks, uh, you know, to, to consistently stay healthy and not be susceptible to opportunistic infections. Um, but that doesn't mean that everyone with an AIDS diagnosis will get sick. It just means that they're more likely to get sick um, over time. Uh, and so, you know, we cover that pretty well. But then also, you know, let's think about the economic piece of AIDS. Um, one, on the one hand, uh, folks who have an AIDS diagnosis are eligible for certain benefits such as housing, medical case management, um, access to um, resources to help them adhere to their treatment or, or even access to treatment itself. Um, and, you know, an AIDS diagnosis is also something that the government tracks for things like funding, for grants, for research. Um, there's there's a, a quite a bit of research happening right now for a cure for HIV, um, and those things take a lot of investment. Um, and so, um, and there's also the pharmaceutical uh, 
industry, which, you know, profits off of making medication for folks who are managing this chronic illness. Um, and then uh, political. Um, actually, I want to go back to economic for one second. I, I, I also just want to mention that the folks that are most affected by HIV are folks who are low income, um, who are working poor or living in poverty um, and don't necessarily have consistent access to health care. Um, and that is, that's also an important uh, factor. Um, and that leads into this next slide of political, of course, which is, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, policies and activist groups and, um, you know, political will uh, that has led to medication, has led to housing um, and to treatment. Um, a lot of folks don't know that uh, when um, AIDS, the AIDS crisis first began, women uh, were not considered um, in, in a group that was, that, that was uh, able to acquire HIV. And we now know that that's not true. Uh, but at the time, that was uh, that was the the practice that doctors, you know, were were utilizing. Um, similarly, for folks who use injection drugs, um, you know, uh, there's stigma at attached to that, and uh, you know, having access to benefits and treatment, and even being represented in clinical trials, um, is something to this day that is largely political and really reflects, you know, folks that have a lot of access um, and mobility in our society. Um, and that is mirrored in, in the, the approach to, to treating HIV and AIDS and leaves a lot of people um, on, the, on, on the border, um, on the outskirts. And then uh, the social piece, um, HIV stigma is, you know, really uh, a uprooting, life-altering uh, experience for folks who are newly diagnosed. There's a lot of anxiety about disclosure uh, because people treat folks living with HIV differently, even though, um, you know, they, with medication, can live a relatively normal, long life. Um, the stigma attached to HIV, is, you know, reflects a lot of ignorant beliefs and things that we know, um, you know, through research are just not true, um, including um, how HIV is transmitted, um, you know, and which I will get to later. Um, but that folks, you know, have, have lost uh, their family members or their community or have gone into isolation um, because of HIV stigma. Um, and that is certainly, it has an emotional effect as well, um, even, even with understanding the science behind HIV and AIDS, it doesn't take away from the impact of having a diagnosis and knowing that, you know, most people don't, most people are very ignorant about HIV and AIDS and stigma is still very prevalent in our society and that, that could be isolating. Um, and uh, even though we do have a lot of medications, uh, AIDS is still associated with death. And, um, you know, even though that, that, that's not necessarily true, um, that, you know, that, that association still, you know, has a heavy weight. Um, and so AIDS isn't simple. Um, it's not a death sentence. It's not a guarantee of ill health. And it's not the same for everyone. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the science piece, but I wanted to make sure that we took a moment to really think about, um, you know, HIV and AIDS from a holistic standpoint and how it really intersects with a lot of other, um, you know, social and economic, um, you know, injustices in our society. Um, so transmission, how is HIV transmitted? So these are the five fluids that transmit HIV. They are blood, vag vaginal fluids, semen, breast milk, and rectal fluids. 
Uh, rectal fluids used to not be considered a, a fluid that transmitted HIV until, well, I'd say a little over a year ago, the CDC had added it to its list. Um, there's some, some pretty good research uh, to support this. And so um, these are fluids that in the rectal cavity um, during sex, there can be um, you know, stimulation and some lubrication um, that happens in the mucosal membranes or the soft skin inside of the rectum. And so um, these, the, those fluids can um, have HIV variants in them, um, which is very similar to vaginal fluids. Um, so um, it's not blood, it's not necessarily um, has anything to do with the type of, of anal sex or, or stimulation that folks are having, but the, the fluids themselves that, that are there as part of the, you know, the, 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 system, the ecosystem and the anus. And then um, blood, of course, um, and pre-cum in addition to semen as well. So semen and then also um, the pre-ejaculate um, can transmit HIV. Um, so HIV can't pass through unbroken skin. And this is really, I think, the most important point of this section is to uh, understand that yes, there are five fluids that transmit HIV. However, they can only transmit to another person if there is an opening uh, into their body. So, uh, you know, a cut, a sore, um, and a, you know, some type of uh, abrasion with, you know, an opening, that, that would be a passageway. But, you know, uh, if it was just a bare hand with no cuts, um, our skin is actually one of the largest, is the largest organ in our immune system, and it's one of the strongest. So it does a pretty good job of keeping, um, you know, any kind of pathogens that would be harmful to us out of our body on its own. Uh, it's only susceptible to those things when there is, when there is an opening. Um, and so some ways that HIV can be transmitted um, are through sex, uh, sexual contact, um, injection needles if they're shared, um, breast milk, um, and then, uh, you know, having uh, any kind of, of contact with any materials that may not be sterile. Um, some people say blood transfusions, that is a, that's old. That's not a thing anymore uh, in the United States. So all of the blood is, is screened. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's like, from the 90s, um, and so uh, that's a misnomer that some folks have, but, but primarily, um, you know, the transmission happens uh, through some type of sexual contact or uh, contact with, with one of the five fluids in an opening through drug use or uh, could be occupational. Um, perhaps someone works in a clinic and, you know, uh, they they get stuck by a needle by mistake. Um, that that's also uh, a possible way to, to acquire HIV. So the so the real genesis of this is that there's an equation to transmission. Um, you have to have one of the five fluids that can carry HIV. Uh, you have to have a a method for that fluid to come into contact with the other person. Um, so that can be uh, using having sex without a barrier, sharing needles, um, like breastfeeding um, from mother to child if the mother isn't on treatment um, and isn't undetectable. Um, that can happen over. Um, I will just say that there's, there's also ways to address that as well um, without getting in it too deeply. And then also um, occupational exposure. Um, so folks that work in a clinic that may come into contact with um, a non-sterile object 
uh, that's come into contact with one of those five fluids. And then even with all of those uh, possibilities, it's not possible to transmit HIV without there being an entry point into the body. And so that can be um, through a micro tear um, in the um, mucosal membrane of the, um, the rectum, the vagina, the mouth, um, in the urethra, um, any kinds of cuts or sores um, on skin that might come into contact with those fluids um, or needle stick. Um, and so it really is fluids plus a transmission method and an entry point that have a risk for HIV transmission. Um, and so uh, these are ways that HIV cannot be transmitted. Um, and these are some of the common uh, stigmatized methods that folks, um, you know, may believe that HIV can be transmitted. So hugging, kissing, shaking hands, eating from the same plate, uh, mosquito bites, uh, if someone's coughing, toilet seat, any kind of seat, computer equipment, pens, uh, utensils, um, public facilities, really anything that folks would share. Um, and, uh, you know, this can be very degrading for someone living with HIV, uh, for someone to, to, to hold these beliefs and to think that they are, you know, putting someone, um, you know, putting someone in, in a position where they have to use uh, reusable plates and, and silverware because folks are misinformed about how HIV is transmitted, um, you know, can be really, um, like I said, degrading and, and impact someone's um, mental health pretty poorly. And so uh, now I wanna talk a little bit about prevention uh, and harm reduction. So um, the only method of 100% prevention is abstinence. Um, however, we have some pretty great methods for harm reduction um, that you know can be up to 99% effective. Um, one of them that is not on here, but I will talk about a little bit later is PrEP. Uh, but we also have condoms here, some uh, a clean needle, um, and you know, getting tested regularly and um, adhering to, you know, get, adhering to that on a on a regular basis, depending on how often folks come into contact uh, or have a have a, a risk factor. And so, uh, the CDC um, has a pretty cool tool. Um, where you can see which sexual behaviors um, have a higher risk of HIV transmission. Um, I've kind of just summarized it here for you in this slide, um, but I do encourage you to go and check that out on your own if you'd like. Uh, but essentially, you know, everyone's risk is kind of their own decision, what, what level of risk it is. I may consider something to be medium risk that someone else may consider to be high risk. Um, and so this is by no means a, a static, um, you know, uh, chart of risk. It really, is, it, it really depends on the person. Uh, however, just for the purposes of, of talking about risk factors, um, I've kind of put these things in these general categories um, from this tool. And so, um, kissing, um, dry humping, or heavy petting, um, as some folks may call it, um, having fantasies, uh, using sex toys that are clean, uh, you know, that have, that have been wiped with disinfectant um, or, or clean properly, um, sex with a, a partner living with HIV that has an undetectable viral load, those all have very low risks of transmitting HIV or no risk actually, kissing has no risk. Um, and so, uh, unless there's an, an opening or, you know, if you wanna get into detail, but just kissing with no openings, no risk. 
Um, and then anal sex, uh, vaginal sex, and oral sex uh, with a partner that has a detectable HIV viral load, but, but with a barrier is medium risk. So um, condoms aren't foolproof, they break sometimes. Um, folks may not notice if they're expired. Uh, there may be a puncture in them. That's why it's very important to know um, how to use condoms. Um, also for the insert of condoms, um, if you know, folks may not realize that they have moved the condom or not uh, in, in the condom, um, and that can also increase the risk. Um, and so it's not a high risk uh, using a barrier, but sometimes things don't go according to plan. And then high risk behavior, um, so having barrierless uh, sex um, or sharing toys uh, without a barrier, um, those would be um, high risk because there could be an opening and there's no, there's really no safety net between those fluids uh, in the case that there is an opening um, without a barrier. So what is PrEP? Um, I mentioned a moment ago. So PrEP is a harm reduction tool. Um, it stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis and it is a once a day pill uh, that is 95% effective at preventing HIV and folks um, that are HIV negative. And so it is a medication for folks who are HIV negative. Um, it can be used along with uh, prophylactics, um, uh, condoms, barriers, um, and that this increases its efficacy in preventing HIV, uh, you know, and up to 99, I think 97%. Uh, and so uh, most insurance plans cover PrEP, um, but we do have uh, some assistance programs, especially here in Philadelphia uh, and here at Fight uh, for folks that don't have insurance or are undocumented. Um, and this is uh, the only medication that is approved to prevent HIV uh, currently. Um, and uh, it does not have there are guidelines for prescribing uh, PrEP. However, um, everyone that feels that they are at risk should have access to it. Uh, primary care physicians can prescribe this medication. However, many of them don't know about it. Um, and so um, if you, know, you or someone you know would like a PrEP prescription and they go to their provider and they don't know what you're talking about or don't think it's appropriate for you, um, that it, or for that person, that is not true. Uh, and uh, everyone that needs access to this medication, um, there, there is a, is a, uh, you know, a, a case for them to have access to it. Um, and here at Fight, we have a prep hotline uh, where folks can uh, get a prescription through our providers uh, if they're unable to through, through their provider. So what PrEP does essentially is, this is a very crude um, graphic, so, so bear with me, but uh, this, is, this is kind of a, a representation of HIV. So they're marked here, the HIV cells, and then there's a T cell, which is another name for CD4 cell or immune system cell. And so uh, HIV attaches itself to that cell to make copies. Um, and so, what PrEP does is it puts, it basically has a barrier um, or a force field that doesn't allow HIV to, to do that. Um, and so the cell is protected uh, from being hijacked by HIV. Um, and that's it, that's, it's pretty sim that's, a, that's the simplest way to think about it. Um, it does take about, uh, it does take different amounts of time for PrEP to be effective for different folks, depending on the type of um, sex that they are having. So for anal insertive sex, uh, I believe it's seven days, and for vaginal sex, it's 20 days. Um, and so it's important to talk to your provider about, um, you know, how you can uh, keep the efficacy of the, of of the medication by, by adhering to it and by um, you know appropriately engaging in those behaviors at the point when you're protected. 
Um, but once that you get to that point, um, there is a, a lot of evidence that supports that folks are protected from HIV. Uh, so one myth is that PrEP isn't a drug that's for someone like me or for anyone. And PrEP can help anybody. Um, you know, there's not a type of person that PrEP is for. It is, you know, uh, if folks are engaging in behaviors where they come into contact with any of the five fluids that transmit HIV, um, then they can uh, then they can be at risk. Um, and that, you know, PrEP could be appropriate for them if that's what they, what they would like. Um, another myth is that PrEP encourages unsafe sexual behavior. Um, you know, there's not, there's not a, a lot of evidence to support this other than anecdotal evidence. Um, and of course, um, having a barrier or a prophylactic paired with PrEP um, protects people even more. Um, and so, you know, that assumption, um, you know, can be harmful uh, and that, you know, there are folks that use PrEP with a barrier uh, consistently in, the, in, in research studies um, and that has, has shown the efficacy of the medication. And then also, if, uh, if someone's on PrEP, you don't need to use a condom. That's another myth. Um, it's important to keep practicing safe sex because while PrEP does protect folks from acquiring HIV, it doesn't prevent STIs, it doesn't prevent pregnancy. Um, and also if, if uh, you know, folks are, um, you know, having sex with multiple partners, um, you know, they may be protected from HIV, but if they're not using a barrier, they may be, be uh, transmitting STIs to their partners as well. And so using a, a, a barrier is important. Um, and then the last myth is that PrEP um, leads to HIV medication resistance. Um, and uh, this is, is, without going too much into detail, this really isn't possible unless someone um, has an HIV diagnosis. Uh, the virus needs to be present in the body to build resistance because it happens when HIV makes copies and those copies have had a sneak peek at the medication and how it's going to stop them. So without HIV in the body to see that, um, there's no passing on that information to, to, the, to the next generation of HIV variants. Um, so getting tested is very important. Um, the CDC recommends that folks get tested at least once a year. However, if, you know, every, if folks are having um, sex with multiple partners um, or they have a partner who has sex with multiple partners, if they um, you know, have any kind of, of uh, behavior where they come into contact with five fluids, the five fluids, um, with different folks, uh, they should get tested every three months um, and uh, at minimum every six months. Um, those, those time frames are really um, centered upon the, that window period I talked about um, several slides ago uh, where essentially HIV needs uh, some time to set root in the immune system and what happens is the test for HIV looks for antibodies. It doesn't look for the actual HIV virions uh, in the blood. It looks for the immune response to them that folks um, bodies do naturally and that it takes some time for those antibodies to to be formed and for the body to, to recognize that HIV shouldn't be there uh, and to make antibodies to try and address, to address it. Um, and so uh, by getting tested consistently over a frequency of time, um, you know, you'll, there's less of a chance of, um, you know, getting a test that's negative, maybe because it 
the risk factor happened the night before and HIV, you know, if there was a, 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 um, a, a um, if HIV was able to get in the body and it was the night before that there would not be enough time for the antibodies to form. And so the test would, would be negative. Um, but in uh, three months, that would not be the case. Um, the HIV tests that we have now are, are primarily rapid tests. They only take a minute. Um, and so um, folks can learn a little bit more about ways that they can help protect themselves and keep themselves healthy while they're waiting for their test. Um, and, uh, you know, it is, it's relatively quick. There's no needle, um, like injection needle. It's just a little finger prick. Uh, and um, if you would like to find a testing facility near you, you can look uh, at the CDC website. Um, they have a listing of testing sites uh, in the link here below. So uh, on, there is, uh, we talked a little bit about prevention as far as testing and prep and using barriers and clean needles, but treatment is also a form of prevention. Um, and so uh, treatment you know, has come a really long way since the very first medication for HIV. Um, and uh, if you can see by these images here, this is, you know, 2004. So uh, is the first photo that's, you know, not even 20 years ago. There's several pills uh, that someone, you know, would take each day. Then fast forward to 2009, it's two pills. And now we have several one pill um, options for folks for HIV treatment. So taking medication has become easier uh, just by virtue of having less pills to take. Um, however, you know, um, even though this medication is easier to take and more effective, um, there are still barriers to folks taking medication. Um, that I, you know, should be mentioned, which is that there could be really bad side effects. Um, and then also the medication itself is a reminder of living with HIV. And they, that may not be something that folks want to think about every day. And so, um, you know, that's something to be considered. Um, and then, Um, that leads to being undetectable. Um, oh, I have a question. This is, what does CDC stand for? The CDC stands for the Center of Disease Control. Uh, and uh, they're a government agency that is responsible for monitoring the health care system in our country. Um, Please ask, ask questions as I go through this also, um, feel free. Um, I will answer most of them at the end, but if it makes sense while we're, we're talking, I will, I'll, 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 uh, I'll answer briefly. Um, so U equals U stands for undetectable equals untransmittable. Um, and so being undetectable means that folks um, have a viral load that is below 20 copies uh, per milliliter of blood. Um, and so um, this, the viral load is basically how much HIV virus someone has in their body. Um, and there is a, a great breadth uh, of research that, you know, has shown that there have not been any um, documented cases of HIV um, transmission to from folks uh, through sexual contact who have been undetectable. Um, and so that means this is a really great uh, prevention method. Um, and if you have fewer than um, 20 copies of HIV in a viral load, or if someone living with HIV has fewer than 20 copies, they cannot transmit HIV through sexual contact. Um, that evidence, the evidence for needle injection drug use uh, and um, breast milk uh, 
is not quite there, but the, but the risk is significantly lower. But for sexual contact, um, there, it, 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 will, it is uh, not possible, essentially. There's, there's a quite a bit of, of research to support that. And so, um, these are some, this is just really a chart to summarize. Uh, that same fact. So, so um, u equals u uh, is works for vaginal oral sex, anal sex. Uh, however, prep and condoms can only further protect folks. However, again, um, being undetectable does not affect folks' um, ability to transmit STIs or pregnancy. Um, there are not, um, you know, uh, there's not evidence to show that, that the transmission through breast milk has just decreased uh, when mothers have been undetectable, uh, nor for sharing needles. So those are important uh, distinctions. Um, and there's a question here, uh, is there any, any way to increase CD4 count with HIV meds? Um, and being undetectable? And that's a great question. And the answer is yes. Um, so that goes right into my next slide. So I like that. Um, so the whole goal of treatment is to rebuild the immune system um, so that the body can fight off illness on itself or uh, on its own. Um, and so uh, when folks are on treatment, um, it gives their immune system a break because HIV isn't hijacking their immune system cells and those cells are able to do their job and also the body has an opportunity to produce new cells, new C uh, CD4 cells that can uh, replenish the ones that were lost. Now, uh, not everyone that um, gets on treatment necessarily has an immune system bounce back to the point where it began before they had an um, HIV um, infection. However, um, it will be enough to protect their body from opportunistic infections. So for example, if someone had an AIDS diagnosis and their CD4 count was uh, 100 um, and they get on treatment, their, their immune system may never get back to where it was before they acquired HIV. However, it will get up to a level where they'll be able to um, fight off illness on their own. Um, and the good news is that the immune system already is, is it, it, on its own does a great job of uh, protecting our bodies. Uh, it just needs HIV to stop distracting it or to stop taking over. Um, its cells from doing their their job and so um, the idea is that getting on treatment it, it helps uh, keep folks living with HIV from getting opportunistic infections and helps them stay healthy and it also uh, getting an undetectable viral load significantly just decreases the chances of them transmitting HIV to someone else. So uh, I would like to share some resources with everyone um, because this was a very brief and basic overview of um, HIV 101. So these are some uh, websites um, hosted by CDC and the National Library of Medicine um, and they are great resources for learning more about HIV. Um, and uh, we have AIDS Info, uh, where uh, there are lots of great fact sheets, um, also information about clinical trials um, and um, the medica medications and what they do, what they're called. Um, and then also some basics about HIV, the, the, some things we covered and some things that we, you know, we're not covering today. Um, Similarly, on uh, this site is in Spanish. It's it's the same information. However, 
uh, not in English and Spanish. Uh, great resource. Medline Plus. Um, and Aid Source. Um, these are all websites where uh, they have a search function and you can look for different um, resources and educational materials to learn more about HIV and treatment and prevention. So the bottom lines are that HIV and AIDS are not the same thing. And that HIV and AIDS are not just a diagnosis. Um, they have, you know, a social, political, economic um, impact on, on folks and on, um, in this world. And then HIV can only be acquired through five fluids, um, breast milk, blood, vaginal fluid, rectal fluid, and semen, uh, including pre-cum. And that there are many strategies to prevent the spread of HIV, um, prophylactics, barriers, PrEP, um, and treatment uh, for folks living with HIV. However, not everyone uh, has to be on HIV treatment. Everyone has the right to be. Um, and, uh, you know, someone may ask, I'm anticipating why someone would not be on treatment. Uh, and the short answer to that is that perhaps their immune system isn't, isn't really being that devastated by HIV at the moment. And uh, that's, they may not be able to consistently take medication, which is very important uh, for, for, uh, for the treatment for folks to become undetectable. So, um, you know, even though we have these life-saving medications, you know, it really ultimately is up to the individual um, how and when they would like to be treated along with their medical provider. And then PrEP. PrEP is a once a day pill that can prevent HIV um, for folks that are HIV negative. Um, and this is a very important tool in our toolbox in eliminating new infections of HIV. Um, that being undetectable or having an undetectable viral load means that folks cannot transmit HIV through sexual contact. Um, that's very important. Um, and that there are many, many resources online with accurate information about HIV, PrEP, PEP, and uh, medications, um, some of which I just listed. Um, and I encourage all of you, um, if you would like to know more, um, to visit those resources. Um, you can also contact uh, me at Philadelphia Fight. Um, if you live in the area, we can share with you our uh, video series that we'll be releasing at the end of the summer, um, which will have several topics that go more into depth about uh, HIV and treatment uh, for folks who are frontline staff um, or have family members living with HIV. So I want to say thank you uh, for participating in this webinar. Um, and I'll just ask again, um, we are sending a post test. Um, if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind taking just a few moments to answer a couple questions for us, um, it helps us with uh, supporting programs like this. Uh, so thank you again. And uh, thank you everyone for participating in this webinar. Um, I just want to reiterate that taking the post test will help us in uh, further understanding the programs that we put out and um, creating content in the future. Um, so with that, I would like to say, please also check out um, the rest of our AIDS Education Month offerings at aidseducationmonth.org. You will see a number of other events happening throughout the month to keep your eyes open for the remainder of the pro, um, Project Teach, our Frontline Teach series. And thank you, Winter Bell. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Cheetah. And thank you, Philadelphia Fight. And uh, happy AIDS Education Month, everyone.